I'm going to invite you to take your Bibles or your Bible apps and turn to the Gospel of Luke chapter 4. Uh, we're continuing our Just Jesus series, looking at uh, Jesus' life and teachings in the Gospel of Luke. Uh, if you don't have a Bible with you, that's fine. Grab one of the Bibles in the seats around you. Turn to page 1093, and you're going to find Luke chapter 4. If you need a Bible, uh, feel free to take one of those with you when you leave. That's our gift to you because we want you to have the Word of God and use the Word of God because we know it will change your life if you do. Hey, while you're turning there, would you say that you're more of a lover or more of a fighter? Now, you don't have to tell me, but if you're sitting next to somebody that you know, Tell them and see if they agree with you. Now, not really trying to start any fights, but if we do, we have counseling available, uh, so that's, uh, that's okay. Hey, a number of years ago, uh, some of the mainline Protestant denominations decided that they were going to take all of the references to, to fighting, to war, to battle, uh, anything that sounded militaristic out of their hymnals, and they weren't going to have songs like that anymore. And, and they did that, and I thought that was kind of ridiculous then because I was, you know, listening to their reasoning. They're going, well, that's not really uplifting. It doesn't really make people think about Jesus. And I'm going, you know, I, I'm pretty warped, but it was not because I grew up singing Onward Christian Soldiers. Uh, I don't think that was what did it. But they, they kind of felt like, um, you know, it didn't belong in their songbooks. And, uh, and I think that that's their choice, but, but here's the thing that... that occurred to me. If you read the Bible, it is filled with imagery about battles. It's filled with bloodshed. I don't know how else to put it. And, and that's not just part of it, for, for pretty much from the beginning to the end. You know, in Genesis chapter 3, you know, when you're there in, in paradise, you have a spiritual battle going on between Satan and Adam and Eve. And of course, he leads them into destruction. And, and, you know, in the big Exodus event, you know, where God delivers the Israelites from slavery and, and he sets them free through the Red Sea when he parts the Red Sea and Israel passes through safely, it's like, yay, well, you know what? The Egyptian army followed them and they all drowned. See, th th that's there. That reference to David and Goliath did not begin as a sports reference about underdogs. There was actually a fight and David killed the giant. And it's not just the Old Testament. By the way, if you want to read the coolest, I think it's the coolest story that's kind of violent in the, in the Old Testament, you ought to go home and read Judges chapter 4. It involves this guy named Sisera and a tent peg. That's all I'm going to tell you. Uh, but the Bible's kind of cool. Uh, but it doesn't just stop in the Old Testament. New Testament, the imagery is there. Jesus said, look, the world hates me. It's going to hate you too. So you're going to suffer persecution. There's going to be uh, violence done against you as my followers. The Apostle Paul told us we don't wrestle or fight against flesh and blood. We don't fight against people. We fight against principalities and powers of darkness. The Apostle John, in writing in Revelation about the very end of things, when Jesus comes back, he described it in terms of a battle, Armageddon. It's, it's a word used to describe the place that it happens. And by the way, Jesus wins. We win. And it's not even close. And Jesus, when he died on the cross, his final words were, it is finished, which is a cry of victory, saying the battle is won. So uh, today and for this month, we're going to talk about the battle, the battle that, that uh, we're in. And some people call it spiritual warfare. That's fine. I just call it part of the reality of following Jesus. So if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, if you believe that Jesus is the one and only Son of God, Savior of the world, and you believe that he died on the cross to pay for your sins, you believe that he was raised from the dead, and you have made a commitment to follow Jesus with your life, then understand that we are in a battle. That's our reality. And we see this example of the battle played out in the life of Jesus in Luke chapter 4. Now, this is a passage that's called The Temptation of Jesus because there is a spiritual uh, battle that's taken place as Satan tempts Jesus, trying to get him to do the opposite of what the Father wants him to do. And uh, this occurs right after his baptism, right after uh, he has started his ministry. And so let's pick up Luke chapter 4, verse 1. It says, And Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness for 40 days, being tempted by the devil. 
and he ate nothing during those days. And when they were ended, he was hungry. And the devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, command this stone to become bread. And Jesus answered him, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone. And then the devil took him up and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time and said to him, To you I will give all this authority and their glory, for it has been delivered to me, and I give it to whom I will. If you then will worship me, it will all be yours. And Jesus answered him, It is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. And then the devil took Jesus to Jerusalem and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from here, for it is written, He will command His angels concerning you to guard you, and on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. And Jesus answered him, It is said, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. And when the devil had ended every temptation, he departed from him until an opportune time. We are in a battle. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you're in a spiritual battle. It's going on in your life right now. And it affects every single one of us, no exceptions to the rule. Think about this. Jesus was tempted, son of God, perfect. He faced temptation. We're his followers. We're going to face temptation. And it continues unabated as long as we draw breath in this world. In other words, we don't outgrow temptation. We don't mature past it. (laughs) And I say we don't. At least it hasn't happened in my life. And I grew up thinking that somehow I would get to the point spiritually where I wouldn't have to face temptation anymore. And, and I thought that because of the people that I was raised around. You know, I went to church growing up all the time, and no one ever talked about what they were struggling with. In fact, whenever people talked about temptation, they talked about it like it was in the past tense. Like, I used to struggle with that, and I used to struggle with that. And I thought I was the only one who was a complete and total loser. I thought I was the only one who was defective because here I wasn't, uh, you know, above temptation. I was fighting and oftentimes losing those battles with temptation. What was wrong with me? Well, what I found out was they were just lying, you know. (laughs) They, They weren't overcome temptation. They still faced it. They just didn't want to admit it to anybody. So you're not going to outgrow temptation. It's going to be a reality of our life as long as we're walking this world. And by the way, if, if I'm wrong at that point and you've outgrown being tempted, I'd love to hear your story. Absolutely. See, we're in a battle. And because we're in a battle, keep this thought in your mind. In fact, if you don't hear anything else, hear this. God wants to bless you. Satan wants to destroy you. God wants to bless you. Satan wants to destroy you. And that is always the case. That is forever true. In fact, this is as black and white as it gets. There's no ambiguities here. Jesus put it this way. In the Gospel of John, chapter 10, verse 10, he says, The thief, Satan, comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that you might have life and have it to the full. Have it abundantly. Have it overflowing with goodness. You see, God wants to bless us. Satan wants to destroy us. Jesus wants to lead you and I into life, into blessing, into hope, into peace. And the more that we follow him, the more that we say yes and fight for what he wants, the more blessings fill our life. But when we choose to listen to Satan, when we choose to buy into his lies, when we choose to to follow his path, it always, always, always leads us to death, destruction, and pain. That's a reality. Now, here's the dilemma. Most of us in this room know that's true. We know that God wants to bless us. We know that Satan wants to destroy us. But we continually give in to temptation. We lose the battles. We choose destruction over life. Why in the world would we do this? And how can we stop this madness? Well, I want to talk about this battle that we're in. And first of all, we need to understand some of the battlegrounds. The battlegrounds. Um, I want us to look again at Luke chapter 4. I want us to see Jesus' life, his temptation, because I think it's representative for us. I think we see three broad areas of temptation that Jesus faced, and that translates to our lives. I think it's in the Gospels to kind of warn us and teach us about Satan's strategies so that we can understand them, so that we can win more of the battles than we lose. 
So the first battleground I want us to look at is indulgence. Indulgence. Doing what feels good. Doing what is for our pleasure. Pick up the story again in verse 2. It says Jesus was tempted for 40 days by the devil, and he ate nothing during those days. And when they were ended, he was hungry. You think? 40 days without eating, he was hungry. He was famished. He was starving. Most of us can't go four hours without eating and start thinking about it, right? I mean, you guys had breakfast before you came here, and you're already thinking, where are we going to go for lunch? And now that I just mentioned lunch, you guys are like, I'm hungry. I hope the sermon's not long. <laughs> Sorry. Um, uh, but uh, So he was hungry, and the devil said to him, hey, uh, Jesus, if you really are the Son of God, just stop right there for a second. I don't know about you, but Satan often speaks doubt into my mind about my relationship with God, about who I really am. Chad, are you really a servant of Christ? Are you really a child of God? Do you really think God loves you? you really? he, he does that all the time with us. Just be aware of that. He said, if you really are who you say you are, Jesus, why don't you command this stone to become bread? Why don't you just take this, these rocks out here? Now, a lot of people, like I've heard it preached, you know, the stones look like little loaves of bread. It doesn't really work for me because I grew up like buying bread from a store, right? It's wrapped in a plastic bag. It's sliced already, you know? That's, so I, when I was in the Holy Land, I didn't see any stones out there that looked like that. So uh, that doesn't resonate with me, but it doesn't matter because he's going, Jesus, you have the power. You're the Son of God. You can turn this stone to bread. You can make the dirt chocolate. It doesn't matter. You can do it. And Jesus says, it is written, right? Man shall not live by bread alone. Satan tempts Jesus to indulge himself. You're hungry. You need it. You want it. You deserve it. So do it. He says the same thing to us. You have this need in your life. You want it. You need it. You deserve it. Go ahead. Indulge yourself. So we all face this temptation to indulge our flesh. By the way, it's kind of the simplest, most straightforward temptation that's going to come into your life. And we know that. We still lose the battle. It doesn't matter whether you're tempted to indulge with food or with alcohol or with sex or TV or video games or pornography or drugs. The lie is this. It will make you feel better. It'll make you feel better. And, and you know what? It's true. For about this long, it'll make you feel better until the pain and destruction come to rest in your soul. That's reality. And, and here's the tougher part. God actually made us for pleasure. He designed us to experience pleasure so that the, the things of the flesh feel good. Think about it. How many of you guys like to sleep? Anybody? anybody? Yeah, we like to sleep. How many of you wish you could sleep, right? Uh, yeah, a lot of hands go up. This is the 11 o'clock service. We didn't get to sleep very well. We had to get up, you know, and this is right. Here, God's the one who made us for rest, gave us a day of rest, said to, to sleep. And, and you know what? We enter into heaven. It's called our Sabbath rest. It's a gift from God. You guys like to eat? Yeah, we like to eat, don't we? Yeah, already thinking about food, so might as well stay in that theme. We like to eat. God is the one who invented taste buds, right? Who gave you those little gifts that make things go mmm in your mouth, right? That's his idea. Guess what else God thought up? Sex. It was his idea. He made us for intimacy. Now, he's got a design for it, a purpose for it, one man, one woman, one lifetime. And, and here's the thing. God is the one who gave us this uh, opportunity to experience pleasure. And Satan wants our flesh, wants us to indulge to the point where our indulgence owns us. It defines us. It enslaves us. It's a real battleground for us, for everyone in this room that has a body. It's a fight. If it's yours and you're losing that battle, we've got some help because we want to help you win this battle. We've got Celebrate Recovery on Monday nights at the McCulloch campus, 6.30. We'd love for you to show up. We've got an eating disorder support group that meets Tuesdays. We've got counseling available by appointment. Uh, we want to help you win this battle because all of us face the temptation to indulge. Jesus did. We're going to. And we face the temptation to compromise. Continue the story. Verse 5, Luke chapter 4. 
Second temptation. And the devil took Jesus up and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And he said to him, To you I will give all this authority and their glory, for it has been delivered to me, and I will give it to whom I will, if you then will worship me. It will all be yours. And Jesus answered him, It is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. Satan offers Jesus a shortcut. Jesus, I'll cut you a deal. Here's here's the deal. See all these kingdoms? I've got temporary custody of these kingdoms. In other words, uh, I've got them till the end of the age. And if you just bow down and worship me, I'll give them to you. And here's the deal. That means you don't have to go through the, the suffering. You don't have to go through the cross. You don't have to go through death. You don't have to go through the tomb. All that stuff is wiped away. You get my authority. It's a cheap imitation of what God offered him. Satan offered Jesus a cheap imitation of the promise of the Father. Because if you flash forward to Matthew chapter 28, verse 18, right before Jesus ascended to heaven, right before he left his disciples here on the earth, he said this, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. All authority. Why? Because he walked God's plan He went through the suffering. He went through the cross. He went through death. He stepped into the tomb. He was raised from the dead. And because he did it God's way, it was permanent authority. It was unlimited authority. It was not a cheap imitation. It was the real deal. He is king of kings and lord of lords because he didn't compromise, because he accepted the Father's plan for his life. Satan always offers us a cheap imitation of God's promises. And his, his hope is that we're going to be tempted to focus on the immediate results and try to avoid the pain and take the shortcut and settle for less. Because what Satan offers us is going to lead to destruction and what God offers us is going to lead to blessings. See, he wants us to compromise our values to achieve the things that we believe that we want. Things that we believe that we want. Jesus says, no, you've got to worship God and serve him only. You know what it means to worship God? See, we're here in a worship service, and so a lot of times we think worshiping God means I come, I sing some songs, I pray, I listen to a sermon, I go home. But true worship of God, the way Jesus is describing it, means that you leave here and you live out the values of God for the next seven days during the week. That you're living his values. You're not just uh, paying lip service to his presence, but you're actually saying, God, I want to obey you. I want to live you. I want to honor you with my life day in and day out, everywhere I go, at home, at work, at play. That's the worship that Jesus is talking about. It means that we decide to be a person of integrity, that we love our neighbor. We're honest. We're faithful. We're servants. We live the godly life. And then we trust God with the results. We trust God with how it's going to play out. You see, when we compromise, we're trying to manipulate so that we get what we think we want sooner and easier. And Satan offers the deal to every one of us. It just comes in different ways. A lot of times this one sneaks up on us. You know, that whole indulgence thing, that's kind of up front and we see it coming. But with the compromise, it kind of is a whisper, right? I see it in... uh, a dedicated, committed, single person who says, I want to live for Christ, I want to honor God with my body, right up until the moment that they meet that special someone. And then suddenly all the values go out the window and, and they're like, well, yeah, but we love each other and so God will tolerate that, right? And it's not just young people anymore, it's senior adults too. And I hear it all the time, well, we don't get married because, you know what, uh, we can't afford to, we'll lose money if we get married. And so they toss their values out for dollars. You know what that's actually saying? It's saying, hey, God, um, I'm your follower, but I don't trust you enough to honor you and, and believe that you'll provide for me. That's what that really boils down to. And we just kind of go, well, but everybody's doing it. We're not trusting God. Or how about when you're filling out your taxes, right? It's just you and TurboTax or you and your accountant. And they ask you a question, and you're like, well, nobody knows if this is true or not. And so we lie. 
We, we cheat. You know, oh, well, yeah, but the government doesn't need my money. They're just going to waste my money anyway. Four services, not a single amen at that statement. I really thought that would be like the standing ovation. Kind of. it, but here's the thing. It doesn't matter whether they're going to waste your money because it, it's, it's about integrity. It's not about you deciding. It's about you being honest. And you know the truth, and God knows the truth. And Satan wants to lead us to destruction, and God wants to bless our life. You see, your integrity as a follower of Christ is worth more than any result, any accomplishment, or any payout that you think that you'll get from compromise. It's one of the battlegrounds that every one of us faces. The third battleground of temptation that we see in Jesus is performing. That doesn't necessarily relate to everybody, so why don't you put the word pride beside it if you're taking notes. Performing. Look at verse 9. And Satan took Jesus to Jerusalem and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you're the Son of God, throw yourself down from here, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you to guard you, and on their hands they will bear you up lest you strike your foot against a stone. And Jesus answered him, It is said you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Satan tempted Jesus to perform. Right? Because the temple is the center of Jerusalem. It's the center of Jewish life. And Jerusalem is the center of their whole nation. And so everybody who's anybody is in Jerusalem. And Satan says, Jesus, forget about three years of wandering around. Forget about all those miracles you have to work. Forget about all the stuff you have to go through. Why don't you just jump off of this temple and show everybody who you are and how cool you are? Just gather the crowds. They're all here. And everybody will have to believe in you because you just showed them your stuff. Now think about what Jesus actually did. The crowds would gather. What did he do? He'd send them away. If they wouldn't go away, he would go away. He'd heal somebody and then he'd say, don't tell anybody. Keep it to yourself on the down low. He wasn't seeking the attention. He wasn't seeking the applause. He wasn't seeking the approval of the crowds. Yet Satan offered him that temptation to perform. And by the way, we're all tempted in that same way. I don't know if you've noticed this or not, but there is a culture of, of attention hounding in America today, right? I mean, because YouTube is really useful for things like, you know, showing you how to fix things or understand things, but most people just use it because they want their five minutes of fame, right? They put their stuff on there, notice me, see me, like me, right? That's what Facebook is. How many likes did you get? How many people shared your stuff? By the way, we like our likes too, right? We want you to check in while you're here at Calvary. Why? Because it lets people know that Calvary's here. And where our culture obsesses over the attention, the applause, the recognition. So let me just confess something. I battle with pride every day. This is one of my battlegrounds that I live on constantly. And, and I just admit, I like recognition. I like the applause. I like the compliments. I like the spotlight. You might not have noticed that, right? So I'm up here on stage, and some of you are thinking, I would not want to have a microphone and be up on stage in front of everybody. And yet, for me, it's like, I like it. And, uh, oh, wow. Okay, I was hoping it wasn't a heat alert, because we'd be really surprised by that. So, I admit that. And so when, I, you know, when I'm up here and I know I'm going to be in the spotlight and I know that I like it, I have to protect myself. And so I do that by making sure that I preach for an audience of two. Audience of two. First of all, I preach for God. I'm representing his word to you. And so uh, I have to make sure that God is pleased with what I say and what I represent. What I teach about his word. In fact, scripture says I I'm going to have a stricter judgment than you because I teach this. So I want to make sure that what I say lines up with God. And if he's okay with it, then I'm okay with it, whether you like it or not. That's number one. It, it's got to be about God, pleasing him. The second audience that I'm preaching to is me. I preach to myself. Because every message has to be applied to Chad first. Because if I can't apply it to me, if I can't apply it to my life and my family— then I have no right to challenge you with the Word of God. No right. So I'm going to struggle with God's Word before I offer it to you. That's how I deal with that temptation, that battleground of performing. Now, you don't have the same kind of setup that I do, so let me just give you a heart check on this performing thing. How many of you have ever 
had this happen to you. You've worked really hard. You've sacrificed. You've given a lot. You've, you know, gone above and beyond. And, and at the time of recognition, you were just like completely overlooked. Anybody ever have that happen to them? Yeah, most of us have at some point in our life. And when that happens, that feels terrible, right? I mean, you're just like, oh, they didn't get a plaque. I didn't get a certificate. Nobody applauded for me. What's wrong? And, and it hurts all of us. Now, the hurt is okay. That's just part of the deal. What do you do with that hurt? What do you do in that moment? Do you become angry and bitter and start complaining? Well, if that's how I'm going to be treated, well, I can't believe they did that. I worked harder than that person. I worked harder than that person. I deserve more credit than them. Do you start comparing? See, that's pride. Do you take your toys and go home? Well, if I'm going to be treated like that, I'm out of here. Or do you forgive them? And remember that God will reward you for faithful service. See, that's a heart test. The reality is the applause of men may be pleasant, but in the end, it is just noise. It's just noise. Look, the battlegrounds that we're going to face, all of us, are indulgence, compromise, and performing. And I believe that everyone who's a follower of Christ wants to win those battles. But the truth is, we lose them more than we care to admit. We lose them. So let's discuss strategies for victory. Strategies for victory. Now understand, when I talk about strategies for victory, I'm talking about victory in our day-to-day -day battles. Just the, the day-to-day -day fights that we have. Because Jesus has already won the victory. Jesus already won the war. Remember on the cross, he declared, it is finished. And on the cross, Jesus paid for all of our sins. All of them. So you're eternal destiny is not dependent upon how good a person you are. It's dependent upon your faith in Jesus. So understand that going in. We're, but we want to win the battles. We want to step into the blessings and not into the pain that God has for us. So, so let's talk about the strategies to live victorious lives. And I just want to just give you three simple words, really, that I think can help us win the battle, help us get ready for the battle so that we can have more victory in our life. So here they are. They're so simple, in fact. Let's just call them the ABCs of victory, okay? Here we are, because they start with ABC, yeah, so you can remember them. Here we go. A is awareness. Awareness. Hey, guys, we're in a battle. Hopefully you know that by now. But that's a reality that we need to understand every single day. And I don't mind people struggling with the battle or asking for help with the battle or even confessing their losses in the battle. But it drives me crazy when Christians act like they're surprised by the battle. You know, when they come whining and complaining, oh, it's been so hard following Jesus and Satan's attacking me and it's just terrible and they're all panicked and I just want to go, hey, it's, it's kind of like the Amber Alert going off. I just want to go, hey, don't you realize that it's already been told to you? It's spelled out in Scripture. Jesus told you, Paul told you, John told you, everybody told you it's going to happen. You're going to be in a battle. Be aware of that. So recognize you're in the battle every day, every moment. Ask God for strength. Ask God for wisdom. Ask God for insight. Ask God to protect you from your weaknesses. And friends, we all know our weaknesses. Be aware of them and guard against your weaknesses if you want to win the battle. It all starts with awareness. So A is for awareness. B is for the Bible. Did you notice how Jesus responded to every single one of Satan's temptations? What, what, what was he said? It is written, or it is said. It is written. In other words, think about this. The Son of God, who inspired the Word of God, quoted Scripture to defeat the enemy of God. Son of God, who inspired the Word of God, quoted the Word of God to defeat the enemy of God. So if we're followers of Jesus, don't you think it would serve us well to know the Bible so that we can use the Bible to attack the enemy when he comes at us? If Jesus did it, he's setting an example for you and me to follow. And that's why we want you to read the Bible. That's why we give them away. That's why we want you to study the Bible. That's why we want you in life groups and in Bible studies. That's why we want you the personal act of memorizing Scripture. Because when you memorize Scripture, you are developing skills using the weapon of God. See, the Bible is actually called the sword of the Spirit. It's our weapon. 
God gave it to us to defend ourselves against the enemy. So think about this. There's a lot of people that own uh, weapons to defend themselves with, right? You got a handgun at home? I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand at this point. Uh, I don't want to freak out your friends. So, uh, so you got a gun at home? Uh, and this is Havasu. Everybody's got a gun at home. Uh, and uh, heck, everybody's got a gun in their purse. Uh, so, so you own a gun. If you have a gun to protect yourself, but you don't know how to load it and you don't know how to fire it, is that gun going to actually help you protect yourself? No, it's not. So if you have a Bible to protect you from Satan's attacks, but you don't read it and you don't know it and you don't know what it says, is it going to do you any good in the spiritual attack? No. It really is that simple. If we want to win the battle, not only do we have to be aware, we have to know the Word of God. And every one of us can know it better than we do. So if you want to win the battle, A stands for? B stands for? C stands for choice. Choice. Have to decide to follow Jesus. Now, most of us in this room have already made that decision, that life decision, to become followers of Jesus Christ. And, and so we said, I want our life to be a, in the direction of Jesus. But every day, every moment, we still have to decide to obey. We still have to decide to love. We still have to decide to forgive. We still have to decide to follow Jesus in the moments if we're going to win the victories in our daily battlegrounds. And so we have to choose victory because, let's face it, sometimes we feel and act like losers, right? Right? Now, I failed again. Might as well just give in to it. Might as well just give up. It's not going to get any better. No. We can make a choice every moment, every day to follow Jesus. Look, I know I'm in a battle. I've been telling you guys that for the last half hour. I've studied Scripture most of my life. I still have to choose to follow Jesus. And guess what? Some days I feel like it. Some days I get up and I'm like, yeah, yeah. I want to represent Jesus to the world. I want to live a, a life that's godly and loving and kind and serving. And then there's the days I wake up and just feel like a rebel. It happens. It's kind of like marriage. I just got to celebrate my 32nd wedding anniversary with my wife, Merelda. And, and uh, yeah, it's amazing that anybody could have that much grace towards me. But... Uh, but here's the thing. Sometimes I feel like being a wonderful, faithful, loving husband. <laughs> and some days, not so much. Right? Because all of us are that way. But see, here's the thing. I want, my desire is a great lifelong marriage. So I choose to be faithful. I choose to be loving. I choose to be patient. I choose to be kind, whether I feel like it or not. Same way following Jesus. You're in a battle. God wants to bless you. Satan wants to destroy you. Who are you going to choose? I know the church answer is easy. But in reality, who are you choosing? See, right now, some of you need to make a choice. Some of you sitting here have been thinking about following Jesus for a long time. You've been kind of on the fence. You've been coming to church. You've been with your friends. They've been talking about it, but you've never really said, yes, Jesus, you are my Lord. You're my Savior, and I'm going to follow you no matter what. And right now, you need to make that choice to follow Jesus. At the end of the service, we're going to have members of our prayer team here at the front come up and share with them, say, hey, I'm ready to begin that journey. They will pray with you and rejoice with you. Or, or stop by one of the connection centers and, and tell the pastors there and just say, hey, today I'm starting that journey following Jesus. Some of you have made that step of following Jesus, but now it's time for you to choose to get baptized. You know what baptism is? Baptism is your public declaration that Jesus is your Savior. It is your exclamation to the world that you are unashamed to follow Jesus. And some of you are thinking, yeah, I need to get baptized. Well, yeah, guess what? Five o'clock today, just a few hours away. You can get baptized now at London Bridge Beach. We're going to do that. Stop by the Connection Center and say, hey, I'm ready. Uh, I want to put my name on the list. If, if you repent this afternoon, just show up at 5 o'clock. If you want to tell the world you're a follower of Jesus, we will help you be obedient. Some of you need to make the choice to go to Celebrate Recovery tomorrow night. You've been trapped in that indulgence addiction for a long time, and you've been talking about it, thinking about it. I need to go. I need to go. No, stop needing to go and go. 
Some of you need to make the choice of just going and asking for help. Saying, hey, I'm struggling, I'm floundering, I need somebody to help me pass this. Here's the thing. God wants to bless you. Satan wants to destroy you. Who are you going to choose? Let's pray.